All right, engineers, in this video, we are going to talk about the cerebral cortex, focusing primarily on the parietal lobe. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, engineers, so let's go ahead and get started on the basic kind of anatomy of the parietal lobe. So the first thing that we have to talk about is the boundaries, right? That's kind of our big thing so that we can kind of tell where the parietal lobe kind of starts and ends. So I like to remember the boundaries based upon three ways. We have an anterior boundary, which is this central sulcus. We have an inferior boundary, which is your lateral sulcus or your sylvian fissure. And then we have a posterior boundary, which is formed by the parieto-occipital sulcus. Now, the central sulcus, right, which is the number one, which does that separate, right? That separates the parietal lobe from the frontal lobe, okay? And again, that forms kind of your anterior boundary. Two is your lateral sulcus. In your lateral sulcus, it separates the parietal lobe from the uh, temporal lobe, and that's gonna form this inferior surface, as we said. And then the last one here is your parieto, this one's a heck of a name, parieto-occipital sulcus. And this one is gonna form that posterior boundary, right? And that separates the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe. All right, so that covers our boundaries. The next thing we have to do is cover some particular functional areas of the parietal lobe. So you just see this blue chunk that's just here that we have shaded in just posterior to this central sulcus? That blue area that we're gonna talk about is called the primary somatosensory cortex, okay? Primary somatosensory cortex. And if you guys remember from our um, uh, and model on the, the brain anatomy, this was a specific gyrus where that primary somatosensory cortex actually resides. It's called the post-central gyrus. Now the primary somatosensory cortex in a kind of a one-line function, it's involved in basically our conscious um, awareness. So our conscious awareness of somatic sensations. And we'll talk about this in more detail later, but basically it's sensations like touch, uh, pain, temperature, vibrations, pressure, proprioception, all of those things are consciously uh, perceived in this area of the brain, okay? Now, the next one that we're going to talk about that we're going to come down here is this pink one. It's just posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex. This is called our somatosensory association cortex. So again, what is that area just posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex called? It's called our somatosensory association cortex. Now this area is involved particularly with kind of analyzing sensations that come to the primary somatosensory cortex. So it's involved in analyzing sensations. It's involved in the recognition of those types of sensation, and it's also involved within the memory storage of those somatic sensations. Okay, so basically it provides meaning to the things that we feel and gives us a way to be able to identify basically where our arm is in a three-dimensional space, being able to determine what kind of object is this. This is an eraser, this is a marker. So it kind of gives us the ability to analyze those sensations and come up with a meaning and pattern kind of recognition to those sensations. The last one that we're gonna talk about is this red area up here. Okay, so this, we had the primary somatosensory, you have the somatosensory association, and then you have this red area here. This one is very interesting because it's actually, it takes up a decent chunk of the parietal lobe, but it also overlaps here. You see how it kind of overlaps here after the parietal occipital sulcus? It kind of overlaps a little bit with the occipital lobe, and it even overlaps a little bit here into the temporal lobe. So we call this area here, it has two names if you really want to be specific. You call this the posterior association area or the parieto occipital temporal cortex. We're just going to call it the posterior association area. Okay, so what do we call that area there? It's called the posterior association area. 
Now the posterior association area is very interesting. It's called a multimodal association area, meaning that it receives sensations from multiple modalities. Visual sensations, right? So if you cut from the occipital lobe, right? Remember we said it kind of takes up three spaces. So it occupies a little bit of the parietal lobe. That's where sensations, somatic sensations are, right? Then you have the, a little bit of the occipital lobe. That is where visual sensations are. Then you have a little bit of the temporal lobe. And temporal lobe is where a little bit of the auditory sensations are. What happens is you take all of these sensations, somatic sensations, visual sensations, and auditory sensations, and have all of them coalesce together into one area. So all the somatic sensations, all the visceral sensations, all the auditory sensations coalesce with one another and they all kind of synapse on that one area, which is this posterior association area. And it basically helps with the main kind of thing here is spatial coordination. So it's involved with spatial coordination. Okay. And this area is very, very important and very interesting and also something that we'll talk about in more detail a little bit later. But this carries, covers the basic anatomy and basic function of the parietal lobe. Now let's dig in a little bit. All right, so now let's go ahead and dig into the primary somatosensory cortex. Now if you guys really want to know, sometimes we give a particular Broadman number to this area of the primary somatosensory cortex. It's referred to as Broadman area number 312. So you guys can remember that sometimes they will ask that on your um, exams. Big thing that we talked about with the primary somatosensory cortex is that it's involved with conscious awareness and perception of somatic sensations. Well, what are those somatic sensations? Well, remember, we have two pathways that are gonna pretty much kind of co uh, coalesce onto that primary somatosensory cortex. One of them is called your dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway, right? We'll abbreviate that one there. The other one is called your spinothalamic tracts. Now we've already covered these in great detail in a neurology playlist, so we're not gonna cover all this pathway. But what I want you to remember is that this is where all the sensations are pretty much carried, the somatic sensations that are gonna be going to this area. So what kind of sensations does the dorsal column actually carry? And what kind of sensations does the spinothalamic tract carry? And how is the somatosensory cortex actually going to receive those sensations? It's relatively simple. The types of sensations coming from the dorsal column is actually touch. Now, if we're really being specific, it's fine touch, fine touch. Or another way that we can describe it is also fine and discriminative touch. So it involves fine touch and discriminative touch. The other sensation here that it also carries is called proprioception. So proprioception and some kinesthetic sensations as well. So proprioception, so it carries fine and discriminative touch, proprioception, and it also carries vibration sense. So it also carries vibration sense. All of these sensations are picked up and taken via the actual nerves, spinal nerves, that will come into the actual spinal cord, right? So it'll go through the dorsal root ganglion. We're not gonna go through the whole pathway here, but it moves into the posterior gray horn, into your dorsal column, and then ascends upwards. The big thing that I want you to remember here, and we're not gonna go through the pathway, but what happens is eventually these sensations cross over in the medulla and eventually go where? To the, what side of the cerebral cortex? the contralateral side from the sensations. So all the sensations of fine, discriminative, proprioceptive, and vibration sensations that are coming from the right side of the body will go to the left primary somatosensory cortex. The same concept is that with your motor cortex. All the motor function from the right side of the brain will supply the left side of the body. That's one thing I want you to take away. The other aspect here is the spinothalamic tract. What kind of sensations is this carrying? This is carrying pain and temperature sensations, right? And it's also carrying crude or light touch and even pressure sensations, all right? And these sensations are carried from these receptors via the spinal nerves and they move into the, again, the spinal cord 
into the posterior gray horn. And again, don't worry about this pathway. The basic concept I want you guys to remember here is that eventually, where does it, what does it do? It goes to what side of the somatosensory cortex with respect to the sensation? Well, here's the right primary somatosensory cortex, and this is sensations coming from the left side of the body. So again, I want you to remember that this area, what area? Again, here's your central sulcus. The primary somatosensory cortex, it's responsible for conscious awareness of somatic sensations via these pathways from the contralateral side of the body. Here's one more thing that we have to mention besides the sensation aspect. We didn't talk about it in detail really in the basic kind of overview, but here's what else is really weird of the primary somatosensory cortex. We know it has a mainly a sensory function, but do you guys remember within the frontal lobe, you had the primary motor cortex right in front of the central sulcus. Then in front of that, you had the premotor and supplementary motor cortex. And then in front of that, you had your frontal eye fields. And, but all that stuff was basically going to eventually be involved in what? In your motor pathways, the corticospinal tracts in some way, corticospinal, corticobulbar tracts, right? Well, guess what else contributes to your corticospinal tracts or your motor pathways? Your primary somatosensory cortex. Surprisingly, this contributes up upwards of around 40% of the motor pathways, your corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts. So it's also involved in your motor pathways. So it's involved in motor function via what kind of things? Via the corticospinal tracts and corticobulbar tracts. How much percentage-wise does it actually contribute into this? 40%. Isn't that weird? So it has a sensory function, but it's also involved in the motor function of the body. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that as well. All right, let's come down because now we have to talk about a very important type of somatotopic arrangement of this primary somatosensory cortex. All right, so the next thing we have to talk about here is the somatotopic arrangement of the primary somatosensory cortex, right? So when we looked at it above, we were just seeing how sensations went up to this whole sensory cortex. But sensations, in the same way that the motor function came from different areas of the primary motor cortex, sensations that are, uh, are go to different areas of the primary somatosensory cortex. So again, you have this little type of thing here. We put like a little man. What's a little man called? It's actually, this is actually called a homunculus. But we're really focusing on sensation here. So this thing that we're going to talk about here is called your sensory homunculus. And what's the purpose of this sensory homunculus? Well, again, it gives us our somatotopic arrangement. So if you look here, okay, we have that coronal section. We're going to say this is more of the medial portion of the primary somatosensory cortex. This is going to be more of the lateral portion of the primary somatosensory cortex. On the medial portion here, you see more of the lower limb, right? So here you see the foot. Here you see the uh, lower leg, right? So the low leg, here you see your thigh, then you see the trunk, then you see the arms, right? Then you see your hands, then you kind of see the face and the, the head and neck area, right? And neck, and then you see the tongue. The whole purpose of this is why? Sensations that are going to be coming from basically your lower limbs, let's say, this whole lower limb area, are going to be going to the more medial portion of the primary somatosensory cortex. And then sensations coming from the upper limbs and even the head and neck region are going to be going to the more lateral portions of the primary somatosensory cortex. You're probably like wondering, why in the heck is that even important? Here's why. When people develop strokes, right, cerebrovascular accidents, it's due to an occlusion of some vessel. Well, here we have this vessel here, this little this hole here called the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is going to give off two vessels that we care about in this sense. This one here going this way is called your anterior uh, cerebral artery. Now the anterior cerebral artery is going to be supplying which portion here? 
Did you guys see which portion we're kind of talking about here? Well, here would be the foot, here would be the lower leg, here would be the thigh, here would be kind of the hip and trunk area. This is pretty much all going to be the lower extremities, right? So again, this is going to set that whole anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial portion of the primary somatosensory cortex. And particularly if you damage this area, you're going to lose sensations to which area of the body, the lower extremity. And again, it's going to be on the contralateral side. The other vessel here coming off the internal carotid is going to be called the middle cerebral artery. So what is this one here called? The middle cerebral artery. Now the middle cerebral artery is gonna supply more of the, which portions here? The lateral portions of the primary somatosensory cortex. And again, what do we say would be here? Well here we said would kind of be like your shoulder, here would be your arms, here would be your hand and fingers, here would be your head, neck, tongue area, right? So if you think about it, this whole area here is going to be, that we're gonna be kind of supplying here is upper extremity and the head and neck. So, if for some reason you have occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, you're going to lose sensations from the upper extremity and head and neck areas from the contralateral side, right? So again, to really kind of recap this part here, if you have an anterior cerebral artery lesion, you develop what? Contralateral, because again, it's contralateral, sensory loss, but from which part of the body? lower extremity sensory loss, right? And the same concept, if you have a lesion or occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, this will lead to contralateral upper extremity and head and neck, we're just gonna put HN, sensory loss, okay? So that's why this is important for us to know the uh, homunculi. One other point for the homunculus to drive this home is the size of the body part in the homunculus, there's a reason. That's why sometimes it's so distorted. If you look at it in a textbook, usually you'll see areas like the hands, you'll see areas like the face and kind of the neck region. They're a lot larger. Well, the larger that body part is, all right, so the larger the body part, what that means is that there's more sensation, more, sensor, more sensory nerves coming from that area. So in other words, there's an increased sensitivity to that area. So there's an increased sensitivity to that area, okay? That is large or distorted on the sensory homunculus. All right, so that covers the primary somatosensory cortex. Let's move on to the association cortex. All right, so the somatosensory association cortex is actually a really, really cool area of the parietal lobe. Uh, it's actually, I think, more interesting than the, than the somatosensory cortex. The reason why is every sensation that we experience, particularly somatic sensation, it analyzes it and tries to recognize that sensation and provide meaning and, and basically recognition to that actual sensation. So let me kind of go through what I'm talking about here. Remember we said that we had the sensations We'll draw here green, uh, just so that we remember clearly here. Here was going to be our pain and temperature sensations, crew touch pressure sensations, and that was coming up via the spinothalamic tract. The other thing that we had here in the red was all of the uh, sensations being carried through the dorsal column, right? And so we said dorsal column medial lumeniscus pathway, which was your fine touch, your discriminative touch, your proprioception, your vibration, all that stuff was being carried upwards. And we said that it eventually goes where? To your primary somatosensory cortex, which is in the parietal lobe. Same thing with these dorsal column sensations, right? They also go here. So now let's draw here in blue. This is our somatosensory, I'm sorry, somatosensory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex. Just posterior to that, which we drew here in pink, is your somatosensory association cortex. Guess what happens here? Well, all the sensations that we picked up via these pathways, the, the primary somatosensory cortex sends these sensory signals to your somatosensory association cortex so that it can analyze all of these sensations. The best way I can explain this is by using some examples here. 
Okay, so here we have a marker, right? What I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna have you guys imagine that you close your eyes and grab the marker. Now obviously when you grab the marker, there's going to be some type of sensations that are being carried via all these pathways, mainly the dorsal column in this sense, which is that fine, discriminative touch, all of that stuff, proprioception. And what it helps me to do is if I'm closing my eyes so I can't see the object, and I'm gonna feel the object, right? I'm using all these sensory pathways. I'm feeling the size of the object. I'm feeling kind of the edges. I'm feeling how heavy it is, right? I'm feeling any kind of edges or corners or anything around that object and to give me kind of an idea of what this object is. And then basically I can say, oh, this kind of feels like a marker. That is what this somatosensory association cortex does. In the same way, let's take example, I close my eyes and I let's, let's pretend I don't know what I'm being given. But if I feel it, I'm feeling, again, I'm feeling the texture of it. I'm feeling the weight of it, I'm feeling the corners, I'm feeling the, the again, all the different edges, how much it weighs, the size, all of that stuff, and I might be able to tell you, oh man, this, this is an eraser. Because I'm not looking at it, I'm depending on my sensations. All of that stuff is carried out through your somatosensory association cortex. So again, what I want you to remember that it's involved in is it takes a sensation, right? So here we have a sensation. And what does it do with that sensation? It analyzes it in some way, right? It does two things actually. It analyzes the sensation and it takes that sensation and stores it in our memory so that if we ever feel that object again, we might have some type of thing to compare the sensation in the future to when we experience it. But it analyzes it, right? How does it analyze it? It looks at, it basically helps us to determine how the size of it, the texture of it, right? The weight of it, the position of it, of object in three-dimensional space, right? All of these things. And then after it does that, it, uses, it utilizes all of these things that we've analyzed from it and maybe that sensations that we've experienced in the past to undergo an ability to recognize some patterns of this object that we're, that we're actually uh, sensing. And then basically helps us to identify what that object is. So that's why this is such a cool thing. But the, another thing that you also have to remember is whenever there's damage of this somatosensory association cortex, it's going to alter our ability to identify particular objects and not just objects, but also it helps it also can alter their ability to identify where our body parts are in a three-dimensional space because again proprioception has to come to that area as well so whenever there's lesions of this cortex let's talk about a couple things that can actually come uh, you can test for in your neurophysical exam so the reason why i want you guys to know this is whenever we do our neurophysical exam we we help this this area helps us to kind of really help us to test particularly like if there's a lesion uh, maybe in the sensory pathways or in the somatosensory cortex, somatosensory association cortex. So what are the ways that we do this? Well, one of the ways is that we basically take, like let's say we take an object, right? So some type of object. And again, let's use the example of the marker, right? And we put that marker in someone's hands, have them close their eyes, right? And then they have to identify that object, right? So again, they have to identify the object with their eyes closed, focusing and only depending on sensations. If they can't identify the object, that means that this pathway is not working. This is actually a specific type of condition whenever you can't identify the object. This is called a stereoagnosis, a stereoagnosis. And this is something that we actually do test for in kind of a neurophysical exam. Give a patient an object, have them feel it, close their eyes, and tell me what this object is. If they can't, that could be a sign of a stereognosis. Something's wrong with the sensory pathway or the cortexes here that are receiving those sensations. The other thing here is we can take, let's say for example, um, I take a patient's hand, right? And then I draw, I draw a particular like number. Let's say I draw a number on their hand, right, with my finger. I draw the number eight, okay? And they have to identify the number I drew. 
if they have difficulty, now generally all these sensations are working to help us to basically tell us, all that fine and discriminative touch sensations, help us to tell us where and what that number is. If you can't identify that number, or whatever symbol is being drawn on the finger, this is a particular condition, this is called A, graphesthesia. And again, this is something that we can test for as well. The next thing that you can do is you can tell the position. So another thing that you can do is, let's say that you take a patient's uh, finger, right? You have them close their eyes. So you have them close their eyes on all this, so you're depending on sensation. And what you do is you move their finger up and down, up and down, up and down, right? And let's say that you tell them this is up, this is down. Then you start moving, okay, and you do this. You ask them, where is your finger pointing, up or down? So it would go like this, up, up, down. If they can't tell you the direction that that body part is pointing, that is called a statognosis. So another thing is the inability to identify body part position, right, through that example we just talked about, is referred to as a statognosis. And then the last one, it actually can tell us the, the difference in weight, right, between objects, again, depending on sensations. So if you take, for example, you close your eyes and someone puts two objects in your hand, right? So here I have a three pound dumbbell and here I have a marker, but let's pretend I don't know that. And they put this in my hand. And the, per, the, the, the individual asks me, which one is heavier? And you, it, is your left hand object heavier or is the object in your right hand heavier? I'm obviously gonna be able to tell that the object in my left hand is heavier than the object in my right hand. How is that done? It's done through all the sensory processes being analyzed. And so whenever there is an inability, right, to distinguish, right, the basic weight difference, right, weight difference, okay, this is referred to as a bare agnosis, a bar agnosis. Okay, so this is why I really want you guys to know this area of the cerebral cortex because look at all the clinical cues you can pick up if there's a lesion within the sensory pathway or these primary somatosensory cortex or maybe even more particularly the somatosensory association cortex. All right, so that covers this area. Let's move on to the last area. All right, so the last area that I wanna talk about is this posterior association area. Now remember what I told you guys, this is technically not just in the parietal lobe, it occupies a little bit of a couple lobes, right? So if you guys remember so far, we've talked about the primary somatosensory cortex, right? Then we talked about the somatosensory association cortex. Well, this last one that we have to talk about, which we did in red, is going to be what? the posterior association area. Now remember what I told you, there, this, is, this is actually a multimodal association area. Let's actually explain what that means. That's important for us to understand what that means. So multimodal association area. So what this means is, let's take for example, you have a sensation, right? So you have a sensation, whatever that sensation may be, whether it be a visual sensation, an auditory sensation, or a somatic sensation. That's taken to a particular area of a, the primary cortex. So primary auditory, primary somatosensory, primary visual cortex. So the primary sensory cortex, in this case, let's say sensory cortex. Then from that primary sensory cortex, it's then taken to another area, which is called an association cortex. So in this case, it could be an auditory association cortex, a visual association cortex, or a, a somatosensory association cortex. So now, the association cortex from these areas, right? So let's say that we have the, the three types that we're discussing here. You have the visual association cortex, the auditory, auditory association cortex, and the somatic sensory, somatic 
sensory cortex. And again, this is all the association. All of these will coalesce with one another and make a multi modal association area. So that's what this is. It's where multiple sensations coalesce. So in other words, ability for you to analyze, recognize, and provide meaning to whatever visual stimulus. Pro analyze, recognize, and provide meaning to auditory stimulus. Analyze, recognize, and provide meaning to somatic sensory stimulus and put all of those sensations into one area to help you have multiple functions working with one another to provide spatial coordination. The, one of the big things here that I want you guys to know is that this posterior association area, right? So where is it receiving sensations from? Visual, auditory, and somatic sensory. From here, this posterior association area, it can communicate with a ton of different structures. One that is important for us to know that it actually loves to communicate with is the prefrontal cortex. It loves to communicate with the prefrontal cortex because that's where elaboration of thought, executive function, memory is all involved in. But you know what else it actually loves to communicate with? Part of your motor cortex to help with the elaboration of movement as well. So this posterior association area, it's receiving all kinds of sensory information and then communicating that to the areas which help with elaboration of thought, executive function, memory, and motor activity. The best way I can explain this is through an example that I was taught. So let's pretend here, we're gonna go drastic. You got a beaker of some nasty hydrochloric acid, right? And then what happens is you're not being careful and you drop the beaker of hydrochloric acid. Whenever you drop the beaker of hydrochloric acid, three things happen. What are those three things? Well, the first thing here is that some of that hydrochloric acid spills off onto your foot, right? Spills off onto your foot. And so that is the somatic sensation of the acid, right? The other aspect here is that whenever this glass, this, uh, this flask drops on the ground, it makes a loud sound when it shatters into pieces. So there's also going to be a auditory sensation. Okay, some auditory sensation. And again, that auditory sensation is from the loud sound that it makes when it crashes onto the ground. And the last thing that's gonna happen here is that you're going to have, you're gonna see the actual bottle of acid hit the ground, smash into pieces, and some of the acid spill onto your leg. So you're also going to have the visual sensation of that. That will then, the visual sensation, auditory sensation, somatic sensations have to go where? To their associated primary cortex. Then from all of these primary cortex, they have to get analyzed, recognized, undergo the particular recognition, compare it with past memories, and then what? All coalesce into what? A multimodal association area. What is that multimodal association area? That posterior association area. What is that posterior association area going to do? Well, then it's going to send that information where? It's going to send some of that information to your prefrontal cortex. Why is it going to send it there? Because that's going to help with your executive function, your memory, your elaboration of thought with respect to this. What am I going to do? And then store this in memory so you never let it happen again. The other aspect of this is that it's also gonna send that information to what other area? To your motor cortex. Why would it send it to your motor cortex? Particularly if we're really being specific, it's the premotor, but for right now, just motor cortex. Why is it gonna send it to the motor cortex? Well, if a bottle of acid <laughs> hits the ground, smashes, glass is flying everywhere, acid's flying everywhere, what are you gonna do? You're gonna move out the way. So you need movement to help you to move out of the way. So this is gonna help with the movement or the motor active function, and this is gonna help with the elaboration of thought, executive function, and memory activity. This is what the posterior association area does.
hope that makes sense. All right, engineers, so in this video today, we talk about the cerebral cortex, primarily the parietal lobe, the functional anatomy, and the basic understandings involved with it, and with, along with some clinical correlation. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. I hope you liked it. If you did, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram. Go check that out. Follow us. Also, we'll have links to our Patreon. If you guys want to go check that out, go there. If you guys want to donate, we would truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, as always, we thank you, love you, and until next time. Thank you.